welcome, 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 welcome. I am so excited. We have another Girl Talk episode today, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be on fire. It's going to be inspiring, liberating, all of that. Listen, before we get started, because we have a great show, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to tag and share. Put your loved one names in the comment section. Share it on your platform. Share it. Let's get the word out. We are back. We miss all of you. It was so good to be here. So good to be here. We want you to tag and share with as many people as you can. Blessings, Elder Davis. So good to see you. Blessings. I think I saw Justina as well. Sarah, God bless you. Thank you for coming on again. Who else is there? I see so many. Adrian, Juanita, thank you for sharing it. Thank you, Ella Maybass. Thank you for sharing it. I appreciate it. Uh, Sister Brown, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Minister Maggie, blessings to you. I miss you guys. I miss you guys. Phoebe, good afternoon. Thank you for coming on. Share it. Uh, Sister Johnson, so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Elder Carlita, thank you for sharing it. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, Marie Mosley, thank you. How are you, Marie? Hope you're feeling better. It's so good to have you on again with us. Latasha Walker, hi, how are you? Thank you for coming on. Please share, share, share. All you got to do is just press the button. It's not difficult. Just press the button. Share. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be some great information. Listen, I don't want to delay because we know that tomorrow is Palm Sunday. So I want to get our show started. Let's bring on our co-hosts. Let's bring them on. Let's bring them on. Blessings, Prophetess Gates, Prophetess Cathedral yeah. Wallace, and the Bishop, the great Bishop. Bless you, Bishop. <laughs> I'm so happy to see all of y'all. It's been a long time, long time. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Y'all have been preaching across this entire nation, and I've been somewhere buried in these books, but I'm so happy that we made it back today. Um, Prophet Gates, would you lead us in our prayer, please? Sure. Thank you, Father. We thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come together to share, to listen, to hear. And I ask you, oh God, that you would help us to be better managers of the fruit, love, joy, peace, goodness, temperance, meekness, faith. Against such, there is no law. So, Father, we are open as we learn about a relationship and love and being better managers. Now, God help us and bless the audience and the questions that have been asked by the persons that may be perplexed or may have um, just this longing to know the path or a blueprint. I ask you that we would sow righteousness in the conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Now, we're going to start. I want to uh, show a small clip. It's talking about love bombing. Uh, Trini, I want you to play that small clip, and then I'll go into the next phase of this question. Love bombing is a very unhealthy thing. And if a person is throwing the word love at you before y'all even in a relationship, Ooh. before y'all don't put some structure between the two of y'all, that's that's love bombing. And you should be very afraid of that because there's never a healthy cause behind why someone is just throwing the word love at you without put, bringing proof with it. But you also have to understand with vulnerability has to come protection. The more you are, are willing to open your heart, the more vigilant you have to be about when, where, why, and how you open it. You feel me? So if you've come into this space where you're ready to receive folks and you're ready to, to move out outside of survival mode, you have to be on alert of people who are willing to take advantage of that. And a person that, that I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say this in an, a, in an inflammatory way. I'm saying this in a way that you can kind, uh, to, to kind of give you a space to improve in, I guess. If love, the word was able to get you that far off your square to where he was able to sleep with you, then you're not protecting yourself. This, this newfound vulnerability you have, you're not protecting it, okay? Because the word love should not be enough to, to gain access to these new vulnerable spaces. You had to do a whole lot more than say you loved yourself to gain access to those vulnerable spaces within yourself. And so a person just saying that they love you shouldn't be a key to anything. 
Wow. So I want to give a small definition of what is love bombing. That's going to go with the video. Um, love bombing is a form of psychological and emotional abuse that involves a person going above and beyond for you in an effort to manipulate you into a relationship with them. It looks different for every person, but it usually involves some sort of excessive flattery and praise over communication of their feelings to you, showering you with unneeded, unwanted gifts, early and intense talks about your future together. Love bombing can happen intentionally or unintentionally. Although it is most often recognized by romantic partners, your family members and friends can love bomb you too. So with this definition, along with the video from the gentleman, how can someone tell the difference between love bombing and genuine affection? Bishop, I'm gonna throw it to you first. Let's, let's start it off with the bishop. <laughs> well, you know what? When I think about just the definition, there's two words that 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 come to my mind: manipulation and authenticity. Mm. And I think a lot of people do not know how to discern what is authentic versus what is manipulative. And it's easy to be manipulated when someone is saying things that you want to hear. If they're giving you what you long for, it is very easy to be manipulated. It's very easy to fall into this category of love bombing, which, you know, there's a woman, there's a licensed therapist. She has a book out. I can't recall what it is off the top of my head, but her name is Sasha Jackson. And she talks about psychological abuse. And what was interesting, you can love bomb and don't know you love bomb because you are highly manipulative. If you if you are a manipulator, you're manipulating people and don't know you're manipulating people because that is a part of your method of operation. But I think based on scripture now, <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 16, and 21, the wise in heart shall be called prudent. That means very pragmatic. And the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. I think when you meet someone and you enter into a relationship, you got to be very pragmatic. No matter what they give you, no matter what they offer you, you have to enter that space with some prudence. You got to be sober. You can't be so needy. Uh, how the young people say it, Jack and Cordelia, thirsty. You can't be <laughs> so thirsty and hungry because that opens you up to fall into the trap of love bombing. Okay, so now, Prophetess Gates, I want to throw it to you like this, okay? Because part of the definition says it's excessive flattery and praise over communication of their feelings. In other words, they're saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I think you fly, da, 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 showering you with unneeded, unwanted gifts. How can a woman, because normally, isn't that supposed to be a rap from a guy to pursue a woman? So how can she know that it's genuine when she's getting all of these uh, excessive uh, flattery and praise from what's that is not like how does she know the genuineness of it i would um state that it takes time i would say time you know of course that presentation of that person they're going to come with that affection which is a gentle feeling of fondness and likeness but um it's up to that woman to give time to see their intent versus their attention. So all of this getting attention, um, that's fine and good in its own place, but over time you will see the intent and then it's up to you to differentiate and you know state if you're going to accept that or it just doesn't work for you. I like that. Prophetess Wiles, what's your take on it? Wow, you know, um, just listening to um, 
Dr. Jackie and Bishop, it's it's just, I think, I think the first thing that you have to know is who is this person? Mm. Why, why am I going to date this person? And I think the worst thing to do in this hour is to date and be needy. Mm. Because I don't care how smart you are and how much you have all of your guards in the right place. If you are in a vulnerable posture, emotionally, neediness, neediness don't mean I need you to buy me a pocketbook. Neediness means I'm thirsty for affection. I'm thirsty for attention. I'm thirsty for to, to hold somebody's hand. That's needy. And when you are in that place, you put yourself in a vulnerable position that love bomb bombing becomes not only what the person gave you, but what you received mm. and what you accepted. I think we have to be very, very careful not to accept every, I don't know, nice word and take it to heart. Mm. And I think that if you are really, really needy, I think you need to step back for a moment before you really engage in this person. It's nice, you know, I think as a girl, all of us like to be told we look pretty. All of us like to be told that we're attractive. We 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 talk sweet or we do all the things. I think, you know, Bishop, every time he joins us, he says, they're my Nubian queens, you know, and we all start smiling like he talking individually to all of us. We believe him. You know, <laughs> believe it. You know, just we just believe him, you know. But 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 that's that's who we are as women. And if you are in a needy place, a place where you you need to be fed from this, you are going to find yourself being love bombed. Because one of the things, I don't know, men say it all the time, men like the chase. And once the chase has been received and gotten, then there's no fun to the chase. That's That was excellent. Well said. Now, Bishop, I, want, I don't want to leave this just yet. Um, when a man that does not really feel the woman like that and is constantly giving her affection and throwing out that love word. I love you. I love you. I love you. Even though he's just playing or whatever. Um, how can, from you, from your point of view, can you just give some little indications to the woman so they know if it's serious or not? Just a little bit of the, you know, <laughs> You know, listen, let, let me say let me say this, because see, you always put me in these <laughs> arduous situations. You always do it, but no problem. I'm ready. I came prepared for oh, the you? three of you today. Here's the deal. Here's the, here's the real deal. If a man prematurely, there's, there's a couple of ways to look at it. If a man starts off love bombing, with words of affection and words of adoration and words of affirmation. It's one of two reasons why he's doing that. He's doing it because he wants to sleep with you. He wants to get your goodies, number one. And he knows that is the one of the quickest ways to do that is to shower you with affection and overwhelm you with words of affirmation. Now, let's look from the other side. A lot of times we will meet a woman and we genuinely feel that. We feel that. I mean, we, we feel it. It's it's man, this is going, this, this is great. But then when you start to pull back the layers and you get to know them, men are not good at saying, you know what? I'm gonna keep it real with you. I prematurely said some things to you that I'm finding out through us getting to know each other that I don't genuinely feel like that. Now, the reason a man won't do that is because attached to that truth is a whole lot of chaos, drama, intense fellowship, because no one likes to be rejected. Women would take that as rejection. Oh, I, tell me the truth. No, no, you don't. You no. You want me to tell you a truth. You don't want me to tell you the truth. So men normally are very apprehensive after they have gone 
these distances to show a woman that they're really interested in, I care about you. I really feel like I love you. Man, you're the one. And then after we get to know each other and we start getting to see idiosyncrasies and certain little quirks, instead of us confronting it honestly with dialogue, having conflict resolution and say, listen, you know, I, we spent six months together and I realized something that I didn't realize in the first week or the first month. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't really know if I'm, I'm, I'm committed to continuing this, but most men won't have that real honest dialogue because they don't want to hurt and they want to fracture that woman's heart. But it's better to have the conversation and put it out there so they don't say you manipulated them and you strang them along knowing that it was not going to end in marriage or in a serious relationship. It's just better to be honest because, listen, we all have the right to change our mind. We all have the right to change our mind. It, 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 no, nothing, nothing is permanent. We all have the right to change our mind in the dating phase. Now, once we get married, uh, we're gonna have to learn how to resolve this and, and so we can continue in our marriage. But dating, getting to know someone, no, I, I, I think we both have, both sides have the right to change their mind but they should have an honest conversation. So Bishop, this this honesty came after you had a booty call or it came during the booty call? It could come both times. <laughs> it can come both times. You can find out it wasn't that good. You know what? It wasn't as good as it looked. And you know what? I don't have time to teach you. I don't want to practice. I mean, I mean, there's several ways to look at that, Cordelia. You know that. I mean, some men, you know what it's like? You know what it's like? And this is all biblical. Isn't that the same thing that Amnon did to Tamar? Mm -hmm. That he felt like he loved her. He love bombed her. He felt like he loved her. He 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 lured her in. And after he got her, he slept with her. And the Bible said. He gets up, puts her out. I don't want to be bothered anymore. I mean, that not that the pervading testimony of many of our sisters uh, because they've been love bombed? Are men generally, you know, I, I like you. I want to get with you. And they, and they get with them. And after they get with them, they realize, you know what? Sex may have been good. It may not have been good. Whatever it was, but they came to a reality this is not going to work. And I've gone too far now. So instead of having the conversation, they ghost you. They disappear. They mm -hmm. stop answering calls. They don't text anymore. My Lord, that's so true. So ladies, please be careful. It could be a key to down there. So be careful. Uh, <laughs> Prophet Wallace, I'm going to throw this question to you. If you know your ex is still playing games with women, is it your place to warn his new love? What? If you know your ex is still <laughs> playing games with women, is it the ex's place to warn the new love interest? I mean, I believe in sisterhood. I do believe in sisterhood. I, I believe that there should be some bonds in sisterhood. But I'm not going to call, I'm, and this is hypothetically, I, I'm not going to call Jackie and say, hey, listen, is cheating on you. You know, I mean, if, and, and, and I'm talking about if we were not, I'm not talking about us as sisterhood here. What I'm talking about, if we were, we, we ain't even, you know, you didn't already, it was you that took him from me. And now I'm going <laughs> to call you and say, you know, that he cheating on you. You know, we're not doing that. <laughs> I mean, if you find out, just like I had to find out, you got to find out on your own. I'm just not doing it. Well, let me ask it this way, too, before I pass it to uh, Prophetess Gates. If someone <laughs> called you regarding your love interest that you're in a relationship with now, with that conversation, how do you respond to that? 
well, you know, you say thank you. Thank you for the information <laughs> that you've given me. You know, I appreciate that, you know, and 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 um, I personally don't know that that's fact. But if you know that that's fact, then I I'm going to put it in my back pocket and let it ride there until the fact hits me. You know, I think I, I, there's a cordiality that goes along with that. I think that some women find it important as a sisterhood, you know, um, me and Liston seeing each other and and now he's seeing Jackie, you know, and, and then Hattie calls me and says, you know, I was at the restaurant a couple of weeks ago and I ran into Hattie and Jack, I mean, Liston and Jackie, and they seemed very engaged and they was rubbing hands and faces and all this craziness. And I just, you know, I don't mean nothing, prophetess. I don't mean nothing about this and, and it's all good, but I just wanted you to know. Well, did you want me to know or were you just giving me tea? Mm -hmm. um, mm. Prophetess Gates is on you. My Lord. <laughs> this is some question here. You know, I, I believe in boundaries. I believe in um, protecting one's own self, self -pres preservation. So I think that if um, someone you were seeing, which is your ex now, was seeing someone else, you're out of that. And that's his choice to move on. And sometimes they move on in the same space. And that's unfortunate, which makes it very messy. Um, but I would suggest not to get involved in it because you're going to look like a woman scorned. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, it gets very uh, congested, you know. So I would say move on. If you're definitely out of that relationship, move on. And as it's been stated, let that new person find out on their own. You have no um, responsibility for a man that you're no longer involved with. You know, hold your own dignity, you know, and even even with the sisterhood, sometimes with the sisterhood, you could share, but people hear what they want to hear just out of caring for them. You say, I just want to just, you know, just lay this right here for you, for your consideration. I can't tell you what to do, but I just want to let you know, you give them a little intel because they're in this whole little euphoria of, of he's mine now, he I, I have him now, they're not hearing you. Mm -hmm. so it's just you're expending energy, you're wasting time, and it's just something that um, is not going to garner any greater respect to you because you came and told them, you know, I, I would just leave it alone. I think wisdom says walk away with your dignity and respect for yourself and let her find out on her own. And even if she tries to circle back around and even have an inkling that you felt something or that you wanted to come and approach her, said, no, no, that's not a conversation you and I can have. That's good. Uh, that's is great. that the same rule for, for the guys, the brotherhood? Would you agree with that? No, I think it's a little bit different. I, 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 I would go here. Now this, I would go here. Again, from a from a biblical context, the Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That's what the Bible says. When you start talking about friendship and friends, I don't have a lot of friends mm -hmm. that I characterize as born for adversity. The Bible says that friends that are born for adversity become like brothers and sisters. That's scripture. Mm -hmm. So like Cordelia said, like Jackie said, I, I believe all of us on this screen, this, now I could be wrong, but I believe all of us on that screen genuinely, genuinely love each other and will look out for each other and would have the best interest of each other. Now, in that case, if somebody mishandles Cordelia, and I know they're trying to mishandle you or Jackie, I'm going to make the call because faithful are the wounds of a friend. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to like what I'm going to say. That doesn't mean that you're going to agree with what I'm going to say. But I feel like I have a responsibility if we're friends. I'm not talking about acquaintances. I'm talking about ride and die friends. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to stop you if I can from making a critical mistake. Now, you may fall out with me and later on, you may come back and say, Bishop, you know what? You were right. I was wrong. I apologize. I would rather have that conversation than you get destroyed and decimated. Mm -hmm. And then I say, I knew it. And then you tell me, why didn't you say something to me with tears in your eyes? That would hurt me more than us having a breach in our relationship because I knew I stood up for something that is right. Now, I'm talking now from a male perspective. Mm -hmm. You sisters are totally different Correct. than us men. You all are wired different than us. Mm -hmm. You have the attitude, if he's messing with her, I have nothing to do with that. But if she knew he was my man before, how could she dare cross those lines? And it's gonna cause a breach in the relationship and you all would never have a conversation about it. Men are totally different. Uh, if I'm messing with someone and we have that closeness, like Mitchell Taylor and I have a closeness. Uh, Drew, Drew Sheard and I, me and Drew, best of friends, we have a closeness. He's going to call me because uh -huh. he asks and says, hey, man, I heard that dot, 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 dot. Watch out. Well, man, how you know all of this? Don't worry about that. Just watch out. So I think men handle things differently. They don't go into graphic details. Mm -hmm. uh, most men don't do that. Most men, men don't do that. Oh. A real man's man ain't sitting around talking about his ex to another man that's dealing with him. We don't have, we don't have time for foolishness like that. But if, if you're my friend, and I know that they're going to mistreat you and mishandle you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you. Now, I'm not saying all men are not petty. I'm just saying real men, most men that I deal with, uh, we would not respond that way. We would we would say, hey, man, let me give you a heads up. Be careful. Have, you know, have your head on a swivel. And that's it. But we're not going to be going into no great. I, I saw her at the hotel. I, I mean, not doing all that. That's that's too much. My Lord. OK, uh, Prophet <laughs> Wallace, is it wrong for a guy to change his mind about marrying you on the wedding day? What? <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. Is it wrong for a guy to change his mind about marrying you on the wedding day? I, I just think that that is the worst is the worst insult that you could possibly do. Yeah, because you knew this before the wedding day. <laughs> you knew this. You 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 knew it. You knew it months before we were planning My that Lord. this wasn't gonna go down the way we said it was. Gonna. But for you to embarrass me and wait until the wedding day—that's mm -hmm. an insult. And and that's not even a man. That's that's just a punk. Yeah. Mm. You know, wow. and so I, I if 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 some young lady said, you know, is is that is it wrong for a guy to do it? You better be glad he did it before you just made your, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. either way it wasn't gonna work. Cause somewhere in the plan, he had already decided that he was gonna do this. And the bottom line is he just got to the altar and couldn't bring it to pass. My Lord. So I, I just, you know, that's that 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 right there. Um, there were so many flags that you saw, but you were just so covered with love mm. or love bombing mm. until you didn't even you didn't you didn't even realize that this wasn't gonna even happen. Wow. Wow. Uh Dr. Gates. Mm. Ask, how did he survive? <laughs> how did he get out the church? <laughs> how? how did that happen? Get married. <laughs> no, 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 that's horrible. It's horrible. It speaks to his character. How horrible it is. How how selfish to do that. Um, you know, as uh, Pastor Wallace have stated, he knew already. So um, there could have been a different way, of course. Um, and may she recover. 
from all of that. And um, yeah, that's sad. Now, that's sad. Bishop, how do you feel about it? Because you said that until you marry, you can always change your mind. Would that apply here? They are. Oh, uh, I, I was going to use a bad word when you asked me that <laughs> question, but I, I caught it. I caught it. I caught it before it came out my mouth. Ain't you, Hattie? You know good and well. What letter of the alphabet was that word? If you you know good and well, I was not referring to no wedding day. Stop. I Don't do say that. For the people Stop. That are in the back. <laughs> no, that you know, you know, you know, you know good and well. I want to make sure it's absolutely clear. What do you say? I have in the change. back. What is that? I want to make sure. <laughs> Listen, even if I felt like that. I would never say that in front of Cordelia and Jack. There's no way. I the, you guys go back and repeat it because I didn't hear <laughs> it. <laughs> say it one more time. It, no, it, I, no. I'm, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about, but I, 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 I can't even get it out. I'm almost like Cordelia. You mean to tell me we've gone through wedding rehearsal? Money. We've gone through planning. I've got a dress. My parents, your parents, loved ones flying in from all parts of the country. And Negro, you get to the altar and you don't want to seal the deal. Mm -hmm. Listen, that is so, it's disrespectful. It's, it's selfish. Mm -hmm. It's narcissistic. Yeah. It's, it's life-threatening. That's what it is. It's life-threatening yeah. because... How do you do that to a person? Why would you destroy a person's heart like that? Don't even do it the night before. No, no, no. Before we plan a wedding. Before. Say, hey, babe, listen, I know the date is May the 8th. But you know what? Can we push it out mm -hmm. to December the 8th? I mean, can we? Can, can, can I get more time? Because I'm, I'm not feeling comfortable. Don't lead no one to the altar. But you know what? Y'all may not believe this, but these type of things we see on social media, in skits, in movies, in sitcoms, mm -hmm. we're going to start seeing that thing play out mm -hmm. in real life. And somebody's going to get seriously injured and hurt. <laughs> you don't play with a woman's heart. No. You don't do that. You don't play with a woman's heart like that. It's just better to say, listen, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to work. Yeah, I like the latter to say it's not going to work. I do not, um, you know, give into more time. I wouldn't give him any more time. That's true. Absolutely. He does not get he don't get the benefit of time. He doesn't get that because it's already in his heart that he doesn't want to do it. So he has to man up and say, this is not for me. Um, you know, I'm sorry and apologize, you know, although it doesn't remedy the situation, but be man enough to respect that woman and her dignity and her family and just say, you know what, I, I got to move on and I'm going to leave the situation. You have to do that, you know. Mm, that's true. And you're not the first one that probably have broke her heart emotionally. <clears throat> But at least she can live in this state that she's in, meaning geographical location, with her head up. But to have all of her friends and co-workers, et cetera, no, no. It, it, mm -mm. It's too many levels of a breakdown. And so I think that um, should the woman, I'm going to put now something back to the woman, um, there had to be some signal that he was backpedaling. Mm. And so what was it about you that maybe you were not, you didn't want to see that. So sometimes we see stuff yeah. and we try to tell ourselves mentally to unsee what we see. So you want to also, without giving him, he has full responsibility. Mm -hmm. However, you have to take some ownership that there was some signals that you chose to ignore or unsee, and now you are left holding this, and it takes years to recover from that kind of rejection and let down. It takes years to recover from that. So I pray that the girls will, um, you know, be more alert 
that when you see um, them coming from a high speed with this gazelle intensity, I want you, you're it, you're the one, I guess. Yeah. You are it, and then they're going down like a caterpillar, and they just like this. <laughs> they, some something is up, something is up, and so you know, just kind of analyze that. And that's like, but, you, but you know what? Yes, go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I was gonna say you always see flags. You see flags, even if you're gonna marry the person, you start seeing flags, mm -hmm. and you're so enamored <clears throat> in the relationship that you come to a place that you ignore the flag. It's just like a, a couple gets married and then she says, oh, I never knew he was so sloppy. Well, you didn't know he was so sloppy. You went to his house. You saw the shirt <laughs> everywhere. You saw the dishes were still in the sink, but you, but you went and took care of it. So now that you're married, mm -hmm. now you're going to yell and scream and kick and fight and talk about you being a slob. Well, he's just being who he always was. That's you good. were just so blindsided about the marriage piece until you you didn't miss it, you ignored it. And that's pretty much what you, mm, that's you know you, you know what I was thinking uh as as Jack and Cordelia were talking and, and I think we as men, particularly all the men that's watching, we have to take responsibility for breaking women's hearts. Mm. Forget going to the altar. Mm -hmm. We've broken their hearts before we got them to the altar. Mm -hmm. By not doing the right thing, by not having the tough conversations about, hey, you know, I thought it was going to be something, mm -hmm. but it's not. And I, I know, listen, we both made investments of time and money and resources. Can, is, is there a way for us to sit down and resolve it that, that at least that we can both walk away, her more than you, with some dignity and some respect? Because I think women are more traumatized mm -hmm. many times mm -hmm. than men are. Because when a woman starts getting to a certain age and you have wasted her time, mm -hmm. you know, the playing field changes with age for them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily change for us, but it does change for them. So I think we as men, we have to be a lot more responsible with, with our feelings and being open about when our feelings start to change. Because maybe a good conversation can get you back on track. Maybe it's a misunderstanding. Maybe I saw something that that I misinterpreted. Or maybe I, we both realize this is not gonna work. We're not gonna go any further. But I think we need to have heart to heart, real conversations. And I think men need to be responsible with that. So Bishop, somebody, Dwayne asked the question, is it safe to be like, like, baby, you nag too much? Is it safe to have that conversation so that you can work through? I mean, that was one of the questions that he just, you know, like you, you are nagging, you, you just nagging too much and I can't, I can't handle your nagging. <laughs> that, that was coming from one of the brothers. I guess. Well, Dwayne, a woman is not nagging for anything. So you, it's up to you because you have to be the responsible party. That woman is putting her life in your hands. So if she's, you call it nagging, she's giving you an alert that she needs something from you. So right. So you're able to meet that. Right. Let me just, before we chime more into this subject, let me just say, put this out there again. We're talking about a woman who was engaged. That's a promise. That's a covenant. We're not talking about... <laughs> Uh, a dating relationship. We're talking about someone that's in covenant. It was a promise made and he broke the covenant. And so with that, then there is going to be trauma. There's because you made a promise that you were going to marry that individual. That's not necessarily meaning that he didn't already see red flags, even in their relationship, neither. Because sometimes on, let's just play the devil's advocate. Sometimes men can see red flags in a woman. Right. And say, OK, I can work through this and decide, you know what, I'm still not at ease. I thought I would probably I got other people in my ear that said, no, no, just go with it and it work itself out because we've seen stuff like that happen, too. And then he says, you know what, I don't want to waste your time. I, You know, I'm not ready. That's a little bit different. So it really does go upon, in my opinion, 
each couple, each scenario and the situation surrounding that. Because I think Latasha Walker put, well, what if she cheated? Something like that. And he may decide thinking that he can forgive or realize he can't get over it. These are different scenarios, but because Pastor, we have a Pastor, lot of, yes. Pastor Hattie, let, yeah. me, let me just say this. Let, let me let me say this. I, 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 I know y'all gonna kick y'all gonna kick me off. Y'all gonna kick me off the screen when no. I say this. But I gotta say this. Say it. Your, your, the scenario that was painted, the narrative was they're at the altar. Yes. Okay. Now, if you found out she cheated <laughs> before y'all walk down the altar, I don't want to hear nothing about I changed my mind. You knew. Now, now, when you got to the altar and we do, and we going through the vows, and she say, "I just want to be honest right here." <laughs> she said, "You know, I, I've been cheating. I got it. I'm not gonna marry you." But when we get to the altar, <laughs> and you have, we've already gone through the conversation about you cheated, or I cheated. Uh, you're not as clean as I would like you to be. I'm not as clean as you would like me to be. And we've confronted those things and we have decided to forge ahead and we're at the altar. It is disrespectful. It is, dis it is insensitive. It is downright demonic for <laughs> anybody to, to, to hurt somebody like that. I don't care. No, no, that's you wrong. Felt that you felt that thing. You felt you got too many opportunities to change your mind. You got too many. Listen, if you find out that I cheated on you and you say, listen, let's have a conversation. Okay, we talking. Listen, I, I'm sorry. I, I won't do it again, babe. I won't do it. Okay, I forgive you. Okay, now we get married. We get married. Now we at the altar. My father's there about to put us together. And you look at me and say, I just can't do it. I will beat you half to death. <laughs> I will beat you half to death right there. You know why? Because you could have told me, you could have told me, I can't get over you being unfaithful. Now, come on, we come on, come on, Cordelia. Come on, Jackie. That's wrong. At the all reckless, oh. yes, it's very reckless. It's very reckless. <laughs> it's very reckless. <laughs> but this this one question has taken so many twists. But I do want to say, was Pastor Hattie said, um, covenant. So this is my mindset. Um, if we're engaged, we we have come to a level of commitment, but not covenant yet. Mm. You're committed saying this is the woman I want to marry or I have an intent to marry. Yes. But it has not come to covenant until you come to the wedding ceremony. Then That's correct. Covenant. So we want to make that different. Uh, That's, that powerful. That's powerful. That's you know, powerful. So, so just like dating and relating, you can dissolve that. You can dissolve engagements. It happens all the time. Um, you know, uh, what I keep seeing this thread that's happening with the questions is that there is no commitment. There's no commitment. It's just easily to discard, easily to be in your own carnal nature, you know, what you want, your behavior patterns, and then the adaptation, the stuff that I don't like about you. Now I want to let the relationship go. There's no resolve. So there's a lack of um, maturity. There's a lack of of, of this this whole um, push that if I was man enough to approach you, you're gonna have to walk through some some stages with the person. That's right. Because I don't like the way you clean or cook. That doesn't mean you don't want to. Why you don't want to be me because of that? <laughs> To be a learning curve. It's a That's learning right. curve. You you have to be able to work with someone because we're all flawed. You understand? We're all flawed and everybody comes from a context. So hopefully we can kind of streamline this that we're going to take the question all the way around the world and just stay right with what the person asks. Because if that person is saying um, that that person, the male, uh, calls off the engagement. It was reckless that he waited. 
after yeah. everything you said, that's reckless. So how do we prevent that? We prevent that by obviously you all need to have more conversation, more dialogue needs to be happening because maybe you missed some some conversations or or someone is just speaking. <laughs> This is good. This is good. Somebody <laughs> is not processing well. <laughs> Somebody gonna get hurt. <laughs> but, but can I say this, Pastor Hattie? Yes, Bishop. I believe that this is just what I believe. And, 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 and all of us that have been married, I think we will agree to this. Mm -hmm. I do believe you, 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 you enter into that covenant at the altar, right. going through the vows, but your mind must shift before you get to that altar, mm -hmm. you must see that person Sorry. as your wife. You okay. must see that person as your husband. It's like a brother was telling me, asked me last week, uh, Bishop, I want to get married. And I said, well, uh, when you going to stop with all your extracurriculum activity? Okay. He said, well, uh, when I get married, I said, your marriage ain't going to work. You don't practice monogamy when you get married. Mm -hmm. You practice monogamy before you get married. Mm -hmm. You start weaning yourself away from the buffet before you consummate the marriage at the yes. altar. And so my, my point is commitment, loyalty, understanding, all of those things start before we get to the altar. Yeah. Jackie said it. We have them tough conversations because when you get married, trust me. You're going to have some tough conversations when you get married and you're going to be sitting there wondering what in the ham and cheese did I get myself into? <laughs> and no matter how conversations had you had before, there's some tougher ones that come after you get married living together. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Well said. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I was going to add that, and he's not going to stop his extracurricular activities after a ceremony. <laughs> no, he needs a full detox. <laughs> he needs, listen, his body has not rested, neither has his mind. So therefore, all of these images is before him. And it's going to be hard for that one woman to satisfy it, all of that fantasy. It's just it's going to be and that, but that's going down a whole nother path that I don't want to do that. But um, well, I think I think that this was good. Prophet Escape, is it okay? So, you know, because I feel that your your prayer will is stirring. So let me throw this at you. <laughs> is it okay that I leave my church because my pastor got married to a woman that I disapprove of? Well, you could do whatever you want because you don't have control over your pastor's decision. That's his personal choice. <laughs> no. so, you know, the, the real question is, did you become honest with yourself that you wanted the pastor? My Lord. Like his choice. So that's just geography. You can go, you know, because pastorship is personal, you can go to another church, but you have not resolved why you left. And the reason why you're leaving is because you wasn't his choice, but he and he made another, and he can. He Pastor can. Wallace, what's your take on it? Wow, I, <laughs> I I agree with what Pastor Jackie said, and and surely I think it's important that whoever that woman is, that she gauge what her affection was or is to her pastor, because. Let me say it like this. You can't decide who your pastor marries. That's mm -hmm. not your choice. It's his choice. Mm -hmm. And whatever his choice is as a member of his church, then you accept that choice. Now, you don't have to stay. Mm -hmm. And if you don't create hell in the church, it's best for you to leave anyhow. Mm -hmm. But if, if this pastor, you said that God sent you here, and this pastor is the person where you know that you're going to be discipled and the gift and all those things are going to come from this pastor, then him marrying another woman and not you should not move you from the church. Hmm. Bishop. But I think most of the time we join churches because of personalities, mm -hmm. not because God sent us there. Now that's a mouthful right there. Mm-hmm. Because if you've been at that church, 
and you had honor and respect for that leader, why not honor the, his choice of whom he choose to be in his life? Right. Well, it just shows, you know, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a glaring exposure of what you wanted and you just didn't get that. And life happens. It happens that way sometimes. Bishop. Bishop, can I get an amen? <laughs> well, you know what? I, I agree. What's happening right now? I, I totally agree I'm with, not. With, 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 with Cordelia and you, Jackie. But let me give another perspective. Okay. Okay, here's my other perspective. Since it's a male pastor question, okay? Okay. Here's the real issue. If that male pastor is hoeing around with all the women in the church, that is going to be a problem if he gets married to another woman. Because all of the women that he has been laying around with, probably telling them the same thing he told the one he actually selected to marry, that's going to be a problem. Now, we don't want to talk about it. But since I'm the male, I'll talk about it. <laughs> that when you go to any church, there are always more women in the church than there are men. Mm-hmm. So the pastor, we have the pick of the litter. And if we're not temperate, if we don't have self-control, we will taste like it's a buffet. <laughs> Like sleep. Well, we, I, you know what? I, I, that's, I can't get away from it. It's prophetic. Buffet. It's prophetic. I'm on here with the prophets. It's, it's, it's prophetic. Buffet is prophetic. Okay. I wasn't going to say nothing. No. I mean, I mean, I mean, because this is the real deal. If the pastor is living a disciplined, bridal life, absolutely, and he selects a sister to marry. And he has not tampered with anything else in there. No one's going to have a problem except the ones that are delusional. Mm. The ones that are delusional are the ones who are offended and lead because they heard the Lord say, that's my husband. My God. And they never had any interaction with the man at all. It's all in their mind. Now, I'm a man, so I could talk about this. They're delusional. They're walking under a cloud of deception. So let them, it, it'd be best for them to leave when they're in a delusion. Now, those that God sends that are yoked to your ministry and yoked to your voice and, and, and respect you as that, they're quick to snap out of that because they know, you know what? I was being deceived. That that You know what? Let me get myself together. And they may leave for a minute. But they'll come back. And, and there's never a conversation. I thought, I felt. They got they got themselves together. But I think what we don't talk about is that single pastors, we have to be very careful not to be tampering around in our ministries like that. At the book. If, 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 if we plan on getting married. Even if you don't plan on getting married, that's not the right thing to do because you're supposed to be a model of integrity and morality. And I get it. Listen, I get it. We all have made mistakes. We all have fallen. We all gotten in situations that if we can go back and change, we would. Mm -hmm. But we're supposed to be having these conversations to help people. So if I'm going to help anybody who's listening, do not. Please do not mess around in your church where you are the senior pastor, where you're the one who people are looking to for leadership because it is not going to end up well. Even if no one knows you're playing with the glory of God, you're messing with your anointing and you don't want to do that. Now, now Bishop, um, this question says, my pastor always smiles at me and calls my name whenever he is up. Is it safe to say that he likes me? No. <laughs> no. It's safe to say, no, he don't like you. No. 
<laughs> no. I mean, think about this. Think about now again. This is a man. Uh, this could be a woman's question too. But I, I, from a man perspective, my style of ministry. I preach for all three of y'all. I like walking the aisles. Mm -hmm. I like touching people. I touch women all the time on the shoulder, tap them, laugh with them while I'm ministering. I'm doing all of that. Sometimes my engagement like that. To be misinterpreted, mm. and 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 sometimes it's our fault too. It is our fault too. Sometimes because we know what we're doing. Mm. Sometimes we 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 we're a little bit too touchy, too friendly. Uh, because you can be friendly without being flirtatious. That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen Jack smiles at everybody. Cordelia smile. Well, sometimes. Cordelia, <laughs> not all the time. Sometimes. Cordelia smiles. You know, that's it. I've seen you. You. I mean, you're friendly. You're engaging. You're nice. But you're not flirtatious. Mm -hmm. No one is going to misinterpret and say, you know what? Let me let me approach and see. If 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 there's an interest there, y'all don't even come across like that. So I think some of it is us. I think we can be a bit flirtatious, and we got to stop it. We know we're being flirtatious. We know it. We 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 know we the man. They all looking at us. They are looking at me. We 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 know what to do, what to say. It, I mean, it's attached to personality and charisma. And God gave it to us not to pervert it, but he gave it to us to promote ministry. But if you use it for the wrong purposes, it can be perverted where you use it for sensual sexual reasons. And that's bad. That, you know, Bishop, you're going to get an offering. That was powerful. I enjoyed that. I think I love your transparency. Um, Dr. Gates, what do you think about that? It's just, I, I love it. Bishop has said some very <laughs> However, I want to redeem this pastor. <laughs> you know, I, I got to redeem this pastor. I feel like it's my mission right now. I'm going to redeem this pastor. Hallelujah. Let's make it a choice. Um, you know, I feel that the, the waters were muddied a little bit. Mm. I, I, I do agree. You shouldn't, the pastor shouldn't have not be playing around in his own house. I do, I do agree with that. But I also know that there's other issues that's tied to that, mm -hmm. you know, that we don't have time to really delve into. But I do, I want to come from the vantage point of let's um, bring it in that there hasn't been always a uh, the best decisions when it comes to relationship with this leader. Mm -hmm. There have been best decisions, but now, um, you know, there has been transformation and he chooses. So whomever asks the question, they just ask a general question. Mm -hmm. He gave different vantage points because, you know, by being itinerant, by being residential, we want to give you all these different paths that you can go down and see happening all the time in the church world. Mm -hmm. But I want to kind of flip it a little bit and say in the kingdom, these things ought not to be. They're You're right, Jackie. More decisive because um, if we, our marriage is to represent Christ in the church, at some point that man has to make a decision that two are better than one. Mm -hmm. Now, the all pastors, all male pastors may choose not to marry. There's some that will not marry and you have to be okay with that. With the whole gamut of everything Bishop just stated, they made the choice. I'm not going to marry anyone. And that's okay. Cause that's their choice, but they have to understand the fallout of playing in the house. Right. Mm -hmm. But this question, I want to give it to a clean pastor. And when I say clean, I'm not saying he's never made mistakes relationally. I am saying now he is choosing that he wants to marry someone, right? And then someone decides to leave the church. Neither one of them hold responsibility. And probably that woman that the man chooses to marry could be an asset to the woman who is choosing to leave. 
but she's missing that relationship that could be very fruitful because of not being honest with herself that she really wanted him to ask her. So mm -hmm. that's how I want to kind of style that, you know, answer the question that this pastor, hopefully uh, his track record is not so messy that um, this little redemption story I tried to bring here for him will not um, <laughs> <laughs> work a little bit. No, it was great. We are seeing healthy marriages in the kingdom. We yes. need to start seeing that. Well, otherwise, we're going to constantly recycle the same stories, the same narratives, the same people. And then it becomes very, in. With Bishop, give me a word, uh, incest. You know, it's an incest. You know, you're seeing this one over here and that one over there. It just becomes a, a, a nightmare. You know, you know what happens, Jackie? I think what you're saying is if we don't see healthy marriages we have a convolution of thought that every relationship or every church is going through that type of yeah. perversion and pollution. And I agree with you. I, I agree with you that, that that is true. I was just coming from the vantage point that as a single pastor, it becomes very easy to fall into certain immoral traps because you're not bridal. You don't have any self-control. And I do believe because Jesus said in Matthew 19, there are three classes of people that would not get married. Uh, and, and I believe that uh, they may got not, won't get married. But here's the caveat. Because you don't get married does not mean that you don't live a life of celibacy, That's right. and a life of virtue. You don't have to get married. But you still have to live a life of celibacy and virtue. And, and I think that becomes, for me, uh, the sticking point. If a single pastor says he does not want to get married or she does not want to get married, then they should live a life of high character in that particular area. If not, you need to get married. If you can't be virtuous, you need to get mad because that sends, in my opinion, the wrong signal too. But you're right, Jack. You're totally right. I think that to that person that wants to get married and has lived a virtuous life and now wants companionship, that person should not be demonized or vilified by those in the church because they want companionship now. And now you want to leave because you are not the one selected. No, you're wrong. In fact, she's right. Stay. Maybe his new wife mm -hmm. or maybe that relationship can be formed between you and her or her and him, whoever, that, that will, will make you a better believer, that will usher you better into the kingdom. But when we talk about relationships in church, church is a social phenomenon. And it, 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 it has become so convoluted with flesh mm -hmm. and blood yeah. and lust and ambition and desire until you need a high level of discernment mm -hmm. to realize, you know what? Who is going to be healthy for me to even be a friend with That's in right. sacred space? Right. Exactly. That's right. Uh, uh, Prophet as well, did you want to um, comment about that last question? My pastor always smiles at me and calls my name whenever he's up. Is it safe to say that he likes me? I think that that person is delusional. <laughs> <laughs> it's the word that, you, you know, I, I think all of us have, and, and, you know, all of us have had Bishop Liston to come preach for. He's touchy, you know, he's walking, he's talking, he's smiling. <laughs> You know, and he'll hit you on the back and, you know, he'll he'll laugh. He'll make he'll say something funny and you just start laughing with him. I think as a female pastor, you know, I, I do call out people's name. You know, I call out my musicians. Name, I call my son's name. I call out some of the other male pastors name. I'm not being flirtatious with them. It's just how you dynamically get the attention of the entire congregation. Mm -hmm. It's your mechanism of audience control. That's really what it is. Now, if you think, if you like him and he's calling your name, 
then now there's something else going on. If there has been other things that have been said in the back room, you walk into the back to go to the fellowship hall and he stops you and has this conversation and starts calling your name. Then there's some other energy. But right here it says your pastor smiles and calls your name whenever he's up. I don't know if that's safe to say he likes you. You know, is that what you want him to be liking you? Or is he just being a pastor that calls your name? We can't judge that call because no. we don't know all the dynamics that go along with that question. That's good. This next question, it says, when is it appropriate for a pastor to introduce the woman he will marry to their congregation? Uh, Dr. Gates, I'm going to throw that to you. And then Prophet as well as then Bishop. That's a wonderful question. I would say, <laughs> I would say to the level of his pursuit should be the level of his presentation. Mm. So, um, yeah, he definitely, but I do think the wisdom, let me say this, if that pastor, and I'm not trying to be funny, but if that pastor has a small congregation, and I would translate that as a mission, then you have to just go on out to dinner. <laughs> but when you're talking about an institution, you're talking about, you know, a large congregation with different um, arms of ministry and business, etc. cetera. Um, why not mutually talk about the way um, that woman would be presented that would... Um, uh, de-escalate, I would say, de-escalate uh, the, the anxiety level. Because remember now, depending on how long this pastor has been single, um, they've only known him. Mm -hmm. and they could be very territorial, maybe not against you, but just territorial because he's been theirs. Mm -hmm. Because he's been theirs, they become a little selfish and maybe overly entitled with his time and what he's meant to them. So you have to move with the grace that you can mesh into the fabric of a ministry and not cause chaos because you need that level of attention. Because here's the point for the woman. I know I would say, well, I ain't going to do that. Can't do that. No. <laughs> For the woman, you should be so self-assured and confident, you know, confident that you don't need that pastor to campaign for you as his woman mm. and announce you. I, I think that the meshing and the coming together, it should come very organically um, without an announcement. So whatever asset you are to him personally, and then um, for all who he is, et cetera, organically just let it just evolve and come forth. And then that man, he was smart enough to select you. He was smart enough to date you. He was smart enough to make a commitment. He already had a plan. He's been a great manager all this time. Why get to the point of the public display and kind of have um, an indirect demand, you know, announce, I'm getting ready to be your wife. <laughs> let the people know. Just let it happen. And then when he feels he needs to say another announcement or for whatever that looks like for you all, then allow him to do it in his own time. Love it. You know, I don't think that definitely because, um, you know, Hebrews, is it? Is it Hebrews? Hebrews 13 and 4 says that marriage is honorable. So I think that um, the honor of his selection, he wouldn't want it to be hidden because then I would question him. You know, I would question him because I'm not, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to hide in a closet. You're not going to be coming into church minutes later. You know, don't take the pressure off. Mm -hmm. Just be what you have been selected to be for him and it will unfold in its time. And then you both will actually be making your own announcement. Just do the work of the ministry. And that's just my take. 
That's good. That's good. Prophetess Wallace. Um, I'm going to go another take. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to join in. Come on. <laughs> so the question is, when is it appropriate for a pastor to introduce the woman who he will marry to his congregation? First, first of all is, is again, it is his decision to marry this woman. And that's without question. But I do believe that if it is one who has been single, as Pastor Jackie said, uh, for a long period of time, and now you are in the stages of getting married, I think the appropriate way to do it is in stages. I think the first level of people that needs to know that you're getting married is those elders, those, those lead people that support you as an inner circle. They support your ministry, they support your vision, et cetera, et cetera. But I also think that when you introduce that you are going to get married, I don't think it should be something that you say, um, I'm going to get married. I think you should be very emphatic. This is a decision that you and she have already made. And, and I am going to get married. This is not to ask you, can I get married? I am saying that I am getting married and I am getting married on this date. In the next six months will be, and then this is my announcement that I'm getting married in the next six months, the date of our marriage will be in place. You see what I'm saying? Then yeah. when it comes to, because people talk and, and I've always learned from great men that rather than have people talk, let me give you the information so you'll have something factual to talk about. You see what I'm saying? That, so, so I think that that's the first tier. You, you drop it there so that they have a moment, not a year, not years to process, but you give them that opportunity to process because leadership is your support. Mm -hmm. And then with, within a week or two weeks after they have processed, I think you do need to say, I have made a decision to marry this wonderful, amazing woman that I have fallen in love with. I'm, and you don't have to say I'm not asking you, but I'm saying to you as a congregation of people that I pastor, that I disciple, that my decision to marry her and we will be married in the next six months. By this time, she has a ring on her finger. This is not an announcement of engagement. This is an announcement of marriage. Okay. So, so you didn't have to see the engagement. I'm telling you we're getting married. You see what I'm saying? And I think that that way, this is not, I'm not asking permission. This is what pastor is getting ready to do. And those, you know, I, you know, engagements are cute if you're young, but if you're, if you're kind of in a seasoned place in your life, you and him can go someplace. We don't have to have cameras on. We don't have to have visible things happening. He puts that wonderful ring on my finger. I'm engaged. We're getting married. This is the way, this is the way we handle it. And you know what? We've all seen it before. There are going to be people that leave. If you've been a single pastor for a while, there are going to be people that leave. So you expect all those women, I think Bishop Liston said it well, all those women that were delusional that they were supposed to be my wife, they're going to they're gonna either calm themselves down or they're going to leave. But the reality is I'm not asking permission to marry this woman. I am saying to you, I am marrying her and she has a ring on her finger. And at the end of the day, in the next blah, 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 this will be our day. You might get up there and say in the next 30 days, 45 days, our, we're getting married and we're inviting all of you to our church wedding. It, you know, I, I think that that is the way a senior pastor should do that. Who has been pastoring for a while and who has been single uh, in that period of time that the parishioners you know, I, I that that's my take on it. Wow, it's, it's a good take. Is that that pastor being accountable? You know, as a senior leader, and it, and it has a, a great honor on it too. I think that's great because either way, someone is going to be unhappy, and it's not even about that. It's not about the happiness or the state of the response or the reaction to your personal life's decision, but it's about us all, you know, living in that amongst each and other. And what you don't want 
is people making their own uh, what people are saying. Mm -hmm. You don't want that. You, you don't want people to start saying, oh, I think, or did you see, or I heard. Let me tell my own story so that it's my story and not what people are saying. That's just so, Prophetess Wiles, you're saying that it's more about the announcement of the marriage, not the announcement of the engagement. So if you go into your congregation, there should be engagement already in place, the sign of, you know, commitment there and all of that stuff. And now you are making an announcement of marriage. Bishop, what's your take on it? I think, I think Jack and Cordelia answered that question wonderfully. Uh, if I was going to add anything to it, it would simply be, I think, I don't think one size fits all. I think it it all depends on that person because they know their congregation. They know the culture of their church. They know their context. But I do believe that uh, no one should be a secret. Mm -hmm. But I think you should always want to protect your privacy. And I think Secret is when you have something to hide. Mm -hmm. Privacy is when you have something to protect. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we need to draw that line and say, listen, you're not a secret because you're here. You're in the public eye. You're working, you're operating, you're functioning. But what we do privately is nobody's business. That's our time. And I'm going to protect that. Uh, I do like the whole idea of stages. I love that mm -hmm. because I think when you have leadership in place, you mm -hmm. are as the senior leader responsible for those, you know, accountable to those second tier leaders. Mm -hmm. And they should be the ones that you share that information with first, because when you stand up before your congregation, if your second tier leadership is supporting you, whoever they have influence with is going to support you as well. Mm -hmm. So I think how things are handled and presented, I think that is vitally important. If they see you out to eat with, with the woman uh, and you running under the table, I think that's a problem. <laughs> they see you out. Hey, hey, come over. I want you to, I want you to introduce, I want to introduce you to somebody. Uh, they see you out with somebody that, that you're in church with all the time. Hey, you're, we're out eating. A lot of things don't have to be said. If you conduct yourself accordingly, mm -hmm. people then respect certain boundaries. Now you're always going to have a segment of people that are intrusive, that are downright nosy, uh, that will write and script their own narrative, uh, as Cordelia so eloquently said it. But I think how you conduct yourself is the narrative. If you do it with honor and respect, if you if you if you show that person um, uh, honor in front of the people, uh, if they see that you 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 defer to them and that you speak well of them. And after service, they see you interact with them, not in a lewd way, but they see you interact with them. And this is what I found out about people. They marry who they want, mm -hmm. but they want you to marry who they want. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You marry who you want. I marry who I want. Uh, and, and nine times out of 10, most of them that come to us that want to get married have already made up in their mind. They're going to marry this person mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, but, but again, you, you know, like I said, one size doesn't fit all. And it really depends on your congregation. As Jackie said earlier, you know, your congregation has to be strong enough mm -hmm. to handle that kind of transition. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to uh, articulate it to them. And then it does have to happen organically. No one should be forced on your church. That's, right. That's the worst thing to do to force somebody on. You know what? He here now. <laughs> he here now. Y'all better respect him. No, it doesn't work like that. No, no. You got to bring them into the family at the right speed, the right rate, the right increments. So I, I do believe stages is very important. 
That's mm -hmm. good. Um, we are at the last question. Um, we're at the last question. This has been so good. Is it wise to receive marital advice or counsel from your pastor if they don't like whom you are married to? <laughs> if they don't like your husband or your wife, is it wise to receive marital advice or counsel from your pastor if they don't like your spouse? So we'll throw it to you, Prophetess Wallace, and then to uh, <laughs> Dr. Gates. <laughs> You know, I've not been pastoring as long as uh, Bishop and and Dr. Gates and uh, <laughs> uh, um, I think that if you're going to be honest as a leader and you cannot be healthy in your counseling, I think you have to be able to not say I don't like your spouse or your. <laughs> But I do think that you have to be um, able to say, I think I need to defer you mm -hmm. to someone who possibly um, could counsel you from another perspective. And in that process, um, you're not damaging your relationship with your member. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, if let me just put it out there. So, so Bishop Liston is getting ready to marry Dr. Jackie, right? And for whatever reason, I'm she's saying no way, no. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 maybe in my surrounding areas, I've heard so much. I've heard so much about Bishop Liston. Mm -hmm. And so I join <laughs> bishops. Yeah. And 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 so I, you know, like I feel I feel a way about him. I feel an absolute way about him. And even though she, Dr. Jackie loves him and thinks he's wonderful, and 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 in my head, I still have this place. Now it's my responsibility to also be a good pastor. But if I'm going to be conflicted in my counseling, I don't think it's fair for me to counsel, even if I'm the pastor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Dr. Gates. You know, <laughs> I was going to make a joke, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but you can't learn. You can't learn from someone you resent. Mm -hmm. you can't learn. And I wouldn't want, I would, because the Bible says that in the multitude of counselors is safety. Mm -hmm. so there should be, I should feel well, both of us should feel safety coming to our leader to hear, to hear the constructive, to hear, you know, um, the corrective, you know, to hear, you know, the things that are not so savory. We should be willing to hear not just all the endorsement and the affirmations. So we should. But if that this thing is personal for your pastor, um, it wouldn't be wise. I, I do agree with Pastor Wallace. Just, just refer them out, outsource it to someone else. And Bishop, maybe they wanted your man. I don't know. <laughs> I have to get that in there. I don't know. <laughs> just maybe. It's always a possibility. You know, possibly. This this it's, question for me. They are flipped. It's not a difficult question, but I don't want to be disingenuous and, and give you the politically correct answer. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm at a place now in my life. I would pre prefer not to counsel anyone because most of them I don't like, to be quite frank with you. I don't like the way they handle God. They handle me. They handle the things of God. And it, 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 you have to, I don't think people understand pastoring and counseling. Not only do they go hand in hand, but they can be, they can be conflicting. It could be oxymoronic because what I really want to tell you could really damage you. Yeah. If I really unpack your issue, I could hurt you. So it's almost better to farm it out to someone else that is professional, that can help you and give you some tools 
because a lot of what you want to hear is me endorsing a decision that you've already made. And then you waste a lot of my time. Mm. I mean, I, I, it, 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 that don't even get me started. How many people in my ministry that are married, that re remain married, that are getting married, that are no longer married. And I looked over all these individuals and they, most of them wasted my time because they already knew what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. They needed me to help salvage something that they couldn't salvage. Mm -hmm. There's no reciprocal value to it at all. Uh, and just because you give me money on an anniversary, that does not mean that you value me. That's right. What values me is do the right thing by me. Mm -hmm. And that's not money. That's by God. Do what's right by God. So to your question, I don't think it's healthy to go to anybody for counseling that don't care for someone that you're connected to. Because they're not going to give you good counseling. Period. I don't care how spiritual we are. There are people in our ministries that we genuinely love and they get married to idiots and we know they're an idiot. We know it. And we want to say to them, you know, that's an idiot you're sleeping with every night. You know that, right? You know, that's, you know, it's not going nowhere. You know, you're going to have kids by this person and it's going to be just you and kids. You know that <laughs> they're not going to change. Then they're going to get closer to God. They're not going to do anything. They don't want to hear that. They say they want to hear that. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's come on, come on, come on, Jack. Come on, Cordelia. Come on, Pastor Hattie. They say they want to hear the truth. But when you start giving it to them that way, mm -hmm. you're hating on them. Yeah. You're jealous. Why would I be jealous of your relationship? I don't want none of it. <laughs> These are the type of things you start hearing. Yeah. So sometimes it's better to outsource or form it out to a neutral party that has no axes to grind and say, hey, these people, they're good people. Leave it generalized. They're good people. If you can help them, help them. But I don't, I don't, I don't think it's in any pastor's good interest to say something to another person's significant other because they're going to have pillow talk. And you're going to be the one on the outside because they're going to make up and they're going to talk about you. And this is what they're going to say. Your pastor don't like me. We need to find another church. Mm -hmm. And they pull that person out of your ministry mm -hmm. that was supposed to be in your ministry. So mm -hmm. I think I think it's better to have someone else do it. Wow. That's excellent. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, we are at the place where we are now ready for our final remarks. But before we give our final remarks, let me say thank you to you, uh, Dr. Gates, to you, Prophet Wallace, to you, Bishop. This has been amazing. This has really been amazing. It was heavy, but it, it was good. And I know that the people are <laughs> blessed. I'm going to ask that uh, Dr. Gates go first and then Bishop and then Prophetess Wallace. And when you conclude your final remarks, if you can take up a seat offering, that'd be wonderful. Yes, thank you, Pastor Hattie. You're just such a gracious host and you're so beautiful at it and you're able to galvanize and bring us together and talk about uh, something that's so complex. Um, I appreciate you for just taking the risk to do this. I would say um, to the audience, um, not to give up on what God has designed to be in each one of our lives, which is love. So everyone needs love mm -hmm. and not to give up on it, but to become better managers of the fruit. Um, I think that if we would become better managers, we would see better churches. We will have a emotionally healthy church. We will have um, good, good homes. And then, you know, the communities, it just spreads abroad. So don't give up on it. This was some very intense questions and we came from different um, vantage points, but just don't think like, oh, wow, well, this is just a mess that I'm in. Uh, you know, it cannot be rehabilitated. 
Um, some things can be rehabilitated and then others has, have to be decapitated. God bless you. Love it. <laughs> I'm coming to Jersey. <laughs> uh, as, as Jack was giving her summation, I thought about two quotes from H. Richard Niebuhr in his book, Christ and Culture. And he talks about how Christ is the bride and uh, or the church is the bride and Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. And he says something interesting in this book about relationships and he likens it to religion and traditionalism. He says, religion makes good people better, mm. but makes bad people worse. Mm. And then he says, tradition is the living faith of the dead and traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. I think sometimes we get stuck in newfangled, contemporary nuances of relationship, and we don't really know how to go back to the foundational things, which is tradition, tradition mixed with a faith practice. Your relationships are never going to be fruitful without Christ being in the center of it without putting Christ first and without you having the living faith of the dead, a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. Those cloud of witnesses that have had successful relationships and marriages. This is the season to look at people who have gone through the gauntlet of time and have stayed committed, dedicated, and unified with each other and as Jackie said so eloquently organically grew together and I think that will that will help us as we go on this trajectory towards healthy relationships and marriage. Wow wow that was so good Bishop and Dr. Jack <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> wow so just, you know, I was sitting there listening to both of them and surely, let me just say what a, it's been so long, but it's been nice to get together and laugh and mm -hmm. really hear the different thought processes that we have. I think in totality, we've all said the same thing. Mm -hmm. that the responsibility of the church is to live according to the word of God. Mm. And surely his word never changes. I think one of the defects of our culture and the church is that the church now wants to look like the culture and the culture is saying, I don't want to look like you. Mm -hmm. It is in those moments that we dispel one of the things that God valued the most. And that was marriage. That was relationship because mm -hmm. before there was ever a church, there was always the family and the family could not become until there was a husband and a wife. And so as we look at this season, I've been talking about timing all day and the importance of the essence of timing. Mm -hmm. God does everything in time. And it is necessary that as we recalibrate ourselves, as we look forward to spring and the flowers blooming and the trees turning green, I think it is the necessity of us as leaders and that we represent a church and for people who are in these places of being uh, um, banished from the responsibility of marriage. Marriage is tough. You know, I did it, Bishop. I don't know how long you've done it, but I did it for almost 34 years. And we did marriage and ministry, which can slap you in the face and cause you to not even love God at some point. <laughs> but, but, but the reality is there is that word, I think that Pastor Jackie used or was covenant. Mm -hmm. There's that place of covenant. That's there, that place where the God centeredness of who you are and what you're to become is tied into that person. I pray that this conversation that we've had today will cause not only relationships to recalibrate, but for those that are looking for marriage, for those, you know, it, I, I, I agree with Bishop. I don't know if I'm just getting old or I just believe God more. But at the end of the day, I think that the season of just being sexual and the season of just running after the buffet should be over for the church. And we should be in a place now that 
not that the world is looking at us, but the world desires to have and become like us. Mm -hmm. So that's my closing. I pray that those of you that have joined us on today, that you don't disconnect now, but stay with us a few more moments. This is surely a season, and we've talked about it from the beginning of the year, that it's called access, that mm -hmm. the door has been opened, and that God is not only bringing us to the month of madness and miracles, but I keep saying it's the month of manifestation. Mm -hmm. And this is the season that God shows us his hand of manifestation. We've been waiting for a lot of things to happen and we've been orchestrating things to happen, but it always happens in his time. Mm -hmm. Seed sowing is so mindful to who God is. If you plant a seed, somebody's going to water it, but God is going to sow and give the increase. Mm -hmm. I pray that those of you that are listening, some of you will join me and sow a hundred dollar seed. But more importantly, this is what I really want you to do. Every person that has a fifty dollar seed, I want you to sow that seed. I don't have I don't have a prophetic word to say you're gonna have a thousand fold return tomorrow. But one thing that I do know in this season that God is using this season to manifest his promises. And so if you believe that, then go with me and sow that seed. Methods of giving or Cash App, Zelle, whatever your platform is, I need you to do that. And once you've done that, you know, it, it says, you know, I, I, I don't want to be that person that has to be badgering. But the four of us have given you lots to think about. And we've sowed into you. You're not doing it just to sow back into us, but you're telling God, I am blessed by what I have heard. So sow that seed with me on this afternoon. Thank you for sowing those seeds. I see some of you saying so thank you. Some afternoon. of you. Thank you for sowing those seeds. I see some of you saying thank you. Is some type of uh, feedback. I don't know what that was, but I, it went away. So I thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you again. And and if that's not the seed that you have sow some kind of seed because it matters that you sow a seed in what you hear. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. You've heard some great faith seeds today. So make sure you sow that seed. Can I pray, Pastor Hattie, before Absolutely. we move on? Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you and we thank you for this moment in time. We thank you how you orchestrated all of us to hear. And there are some that will come even after we have gone from the live. But Father, I pray that even right now, all that we have heard, all the times that we have laughed and all the conversations, whether it has been something that we said ouch to or something that we say that we needed. I pray, Father, that not only would you give us to meditate and nurture on it, but Father, give us to understand this is the season of your timing. And so Father, bless these seeds because I ask you as a prophet of God, thank you for every seed that is sown. Thank you for the return that's coming. It may not come tomorrow, but it will be here in the next three days. Thank you for returning back to us the things that we have given to you. Bless these people. Bless Pastor Hattie for her endeavor and Dr. Jackie and Bishop Page. Bless their ministries, Father, in the name of Jesus. We bless you and we thank you for you doing exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could even ask or think. In Jesus' name we do pray. And we all said amen and amen. We're back in the hands of Pastor Hattie. Thank you so much. Thank you for those of you that are sewing. Uh, some of you have accepted the challenge of 100. Thank you so much. I just want to acknowledge you. Bishop, we thank you for your seat of 100. Prophetess Gates, thank you for your seat of 100. Adrian, thank you for your seat of 50. Uh, Geneva, thank you for your seat of 50. Um, Justina, thank you for your seat of 10. Sharon, thank you for your seat of 10. Listen, those of you, um, Crystal, thank you for your seat of 50 who did not have the two main amounts that she asked for. I want you to follow the pursuit of others who gave what they have. If this has been a blessing, help me bless my guests. I want to make sure that I just don't take their time, but I sow back into them because they do not have to come on with us and share. Their, their, their schedules are so hectic. And when they carve time out, I want to make sure that I take care of God's gifts. And they did not 
rush us. You know, we normally try to do this in one hour. We went over and no one rushed their answers and all of that. They ministered from a pure heart and gave us some practical instructions and guidelines. And we will not, Hannah, you know how I feel about this. We will not have people come on and bless us and we not sow back unto them something tangible that they know that we honor them and that we value them. So thank you so much for those of you that are sowing your seed, whatever that is, whether it's 10, whether it's 20, whether it's 30, 50 or 100, whatever it is. I want you to sow your very best and so that I can be a blessing to them. So that way, when I call us together again, we will never have an issue, not even like it's about money, because a lot of them understand that this is an assignment. But I don't want to have anybody on, especially God's gifts and God's generals, and we don't honor them. Listen, while you are still sowing your seed, I want you to get ready because August is coming. I will call it on Hannah's prayer and prophetic encounter. I want you to save the date, August 23rd uh, and the 24th, that Friday and Saturday. If you was there on last year, Oh my God, and this year is going to be back at New Jersey at the Highway Church of Patterson. And I'm telling you right now, next week we will open up the registration where you can start registering. We did not reserve any seating and it was, you know, standing room only. And so I don't want you to delay. I don't want you to delay. Next week when we open up the registration, I want you to start registering, get your name down here, get your seat. You know how we do, whether you break it up, but you do not want to miss it. The power of God, the power of intercession will be in that place and God will be speaking to us and charging the intercessors, charging the leaders, charging the women, charging even the men. So I want you to save that date, August 23rd and the 24th, and it will be in the state of New Jersey. New Jersey, we're coming back. <laughs> so listen, Thank you so much to everyone. I hope that uh, in the morning you have a wonderful time in the Lord and you have sweet rest on tonight. God bless you all. Bye-bye.